Thank you all for this opportunity to uh, talk to you on a, a hot afternoon towards an end of a few crazy days. So we really appreciate it. Hopefully you can hear us all okay. Um, quick intro of Channel Factory. Some of the Channel Factory posse are over there under the table, including uh, Tony Chen, who's the founder. Um, just to introduce the company in a few seconds, we're a purpose-driven social media company, and our mission is to amplify positivity and constrain negativity in social media. That's what we'll explore when we bring Kerry and Eric up in a moment. But just to sort of frame that, safety and suitability are fabulous, and I love the work done by BSI, by GAM, by TAG. But we also have an unfortunate realization there were some unintended consequences. When you see keyword lists that have Muslim women, gay, LGBTQ, black, on the list, you realize we got a problem. So what we have to do, thank you, Kareen, what we have to do here <laughs> is realize that we've got collectively achieved two things. How do we be responsibly safe with being inclusive and effective? Inclusive and effective, we talk about D&I and the inclusivity, but I want to just um, paraphrase Mark Pritchard for a moment. It's actually about being effective in business. Being effective in business is about driving share in, such, in mature markets that are often saturated. And in the world of the brands who are P&G, Kraft and those things, and we're going to talk about it in a moment, half the market share is huge. Mark said half of all the brand growth for his P&G brands in the last three years has been like including diverse audiences. Half of all the brand growth by including diverse audiences? That's fundamentally an engine of growth. So when we used to think being inclusive and being equity and D&I focused was doing the right thing. We actually sort of traded it off against the profitable thing and now you can do both. So what we'd like to do and focus on this panel is getting the right balance by doing the right thing for the brand, the right thing for the consumer, the right thing for the platform. So we actually equate being effective and driving the bottom line with actually being inclusive and effective and not discriminating against audiences. Those days of taking whole groups of creators off the list they have to stop. It is not acceptable. But we got there because it was an unintended consequences. Do you remember chaos? We're all old enough to remember chaos. The early days, video everywhere, <laughs> video everywhere. You didn't want a bad adjacency to your ad next to something horrible. We all remember those phone calls from a client going, what the heck? You're getting smiles. We know that. So we went from this chaos to cautious. But maybe we overcorrected in cautious, and we're going to talk about this in a moment. We suddenly became super safe in terms of sanitizing everything and respectfully it became a bit vanilla. So what we now have to do from chaos to cautious is get to conscious. And by being conscious, we're aware of our own subconscious bias and how we think. We're also more conscious of all the aspects of content, not just the keywords, the semantics, the meaning, the context, the video, the IB categorization. And by doing it, we can now be intentionally inclusive instead of bluntly exclusive. So as we do that, we meet the balance of driving brand growth as well as doing the right thing for our brands, our communities, and our investors and stakeholders. So with that, I want to bring up Eric and Kerry to come and talk about how we turn this into practice. I just want to, one thing I do want to share about Kerry is her degree was in communications and French. Can, perfect. Yeah. It really is the confluence of everything she's been going, even though she's learning Spanish now. So your Spanish is meshing up your French. But uh, the point we're always learning, I absolutely love. And Eric, Eric, have us health and us the evolution of what we do in terms of healthcare and the way that all the different components that we're building healthcare within have us, 30 I think you have, are all together with one direction to drive equity and inclusion within wellness and health. So fabulous to have you both here and um, we're going to have fun talking. So I'm going to sit Great. down now and um, can I just start with a, a sort of your view on D-E-N-I, D-I, D-E-N-I-B, um, let's just say inclusion. Sure. Is it something that we should do, or it's something we must do? Oh, it's something we must do. It's not an option, but we're already too late. Right. Is that a fair right. summary? Yes. So uh, I'll have Mike over to you to talk to <laughs> yeah. get one back. Um, yeah, it's not an option anymore, but I do think that we're already behind. Um, you know, you talked about Mark Pritchard saying that uh, the vast majority of their growth on businesses were coming from uh, diverse audiences. Um, and so we are too late. Um, if you think about diverse audiences in any market, um, not just the US where I live, um, but those diverse audiences are really becoming the majority or are already the majority. Um, and so the fact that we're not serving those audiences 
um, and we haven't been at the right level for years, we are behind. Can I just do one build on that? You know these people yeah. who set a 2% goal or a 3% yeah. <laughs> goal? Does anyone see the census data? Like the last census US, 40% of the population is diverse, but hey, let's spend 2% of the media dollars. Yeah. A little out of balance, do you want to talk about that? Oh, yeah. Um, definitely out of balance. I mean, I think, you know, when people set goals like that, um, certainly doing something is better than doing nothing. Um, but I think when you set goals like that for yourself, you're not really thinking about the true opportunity. Um, so I do think if you start with consumers and understanding how they're interacting with your category, um, understanding that growth opportunity, that allows you to set a much better goal for yourself um, than just an arbitrary 2% to be able to say that you've done something. But I want to bring in Eric here. It's like it's one to target them, but you've got to reach them authentically. You talk about amplifying creativity. How, how do you really get people to understand that authentic nation, your, your team of 6,000, yeah. and how do you connect? Yeah. Well, I, I think, look, I'll go back to the, the we're late, and one of the things that's sort of core to being late is we can't just be stealing diverse talent from each other. We have mm -hmm. to be attracting more diverse talent to come into the business. And that's the, the until we do that, at scale, we're not going to have a fundamental transformation. Your question, though, is, is sort of paramount to what it's going to take to transform the work that a more diverse talent base makes. Mm. And if, if it is not of, by, and for the communities that we're hoping to impact, it will never feel authentic. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so I think that's sort of core. One of the things that, I'm, uh, that I keep thinking about is it is about co-creating content, not just creating content. Traditionally in advertising, we've been at a place where at, at, at the agency, we create the work, then we put out bids to, to various production companies to make it, and then the discussion is with our media partners on where it could go. I think we need to move to a place in order to have trusted transparent and inclusive work, it needs to be co-created um, in order to be successful. So on, on that co-creation, let me share, you, you've got a phrase that I really love, this well-tainment. Yeah. So talk a little about well-tainment and then let's bounce that back over to carry on how you get your well-tainment content to the right people at the right time in the right place. Today uh, was a really uh, exciting day for me on, on my journey in health and wellness, which is one of the things in coming into the health space 18 months ago that I realized it's sort of been a punch in the face, the, the health inequality issue globally. Yeah. And, and I, I sort of think about what that means. What does that look like in terms of people? Um, Japan is the, has the highest life, life expectancy of any country in the world. The country with the lowest is Sierra Leone. There's a 30 year difference in life expectancy between those two places. And we think that's unacceptable. But then you also, the more you get into this, you realize that these health deserts live all over. In Boston, Massachusetts, I don't know if anyone out there is from Boston, the, the, <laughs> the difference between Roxbury, Massachusetts and Back Bay, Massachusetts, two miles away, a 14 minute drive in an Uber, uh, two, two train stops. There is a 23 year delta of like life expectancy. 23 years in Boston, that Massachusetts. Insane. Absolutely insane. <laughs> and you realize this is not a need to have. This is an emergency that needs work. And so we lo we've been spending time looking what work is out there, how do we make an impact on, on this, and we launched an initiative today called Welltainment. And Welltainment is, made, is meant to be co-creating um, uh, wellness educational content that is built into entertainment properties. Um, it is built to live in a world where 55% of the media that we consume is not ad supported, so advertising alone isn't gonna solve it. And it's meant to be co-created with entertainment companies and people in the community. And it's got to be authentically um, created, authentically distributed, and key to it is that we want to do this with brands. And why do we want to do it with brands? Because we're also living in this time of misinformation. You know, and, and it is a strange and exciting time for us all as marketers, which is that people trust brands more than they trust government. 
more than they trust news sources. And so if we're going to make a dent in the health equity crisis, we're, we think that welltainment can make a difference because it will be entertainment, not advertising. Do you hand that over to Kerry? Yeah. To, uh, yeah. how, how does that as a media planner help you or not? Well, I, it does help. And I think similarly, uh, Publicist Group has also um, created what we call the Once and For All Coalition. Uh, because we realize we're also not going to solve uh, everything that's happening um, in the media, e media ecosystem uh, on our own as well. Um, and so the Once and For All Coalition brings together um, you know, everyone across Publicis Group as well as our clients um, and the media industry um, to help start solving some of the problems that we face um, to get beyond that 2% or 3% threshold that brands have been spending historically um, and tackling real problems in the industry um, like the availability of content, the funding for diverse creators so that they can get um, their content on the air, um, and then measurement. Measurement has been a huge problem and um, a barrier uh, for a lot of brands. It's been one of the reasons that brands haven't been able to lean in. Um, and so we're working with brands uh, to uh, joint fund uh, both content creation, the support of diverse creators, as well as measurement programs um, to help prove uh, that diverse uh, content, diverse owned uh, media properties uh, do deliver. Um, so whether that's engagement, uh, you know, views, uh, or actual business results. Um, I want to pick up on this issue you talked about, diverse creators, measurement, and remuneration as those three. Yeah. Diverse creators, you get some people saying there's only a finite amount of diverse owned and operated inventory in traditional linear media, so we stop there. Half of all the creators on YouTube are diverse. But when you go and have a chat with the folks at Google or at TikTok or Meta, they're going, can you categorize them all so we know which diversity they are and we can advertise with them? They go, no, my lawyers won't let me. So we're in this situation where they're all out there. They're all creating content. They can't actually get monetized in many cases because they're deemed unsuitable because they talk about things that relate to their community, which against our brand safety things suddenly get caught up in the trap. Uh, they also limit their access to ad monetization without revenue. They also can't get a bank loan. Mm -hmm. So there's sort of this vicious cycle that right. stops them being able to free up. And one of the initiatives, for example, we're talking about is this conscious inclusion, sort of conscious investment fund to actually almost micro invest in these creators who are creating positive content to break free of that trap. Yeah. So I think giving a voice to the creators and freeing them and being able to monetize them, huge. Mm -hmm. I think that piece that you mentioned about measurement is sort of two aspects. One is you've got the small publishers in the linear world yeah. who can't afford the accreditation. Right. So what, you know, what is accreditation light versus them being excluded? And I think the other side is the social and influencer creators mm -hmm. and making sure we can understand who they are and we can engage. So I think your point, like yeah. how do we get creators how can we remunerate them and then how can we measure them and engage with them is, is absolutely vital. Yeah, and I think once we understand uh, who the creators are, um, it's critically important that um, all creators are also paid the same for content. Um, so when a brand is working in the influencer space uh, specifically, um, it's really important that there's equal pay for all creators. Um, and that hasn't been something that's historically been happening and I know um, there's a number of people and a number of brands who are really um, supporting and championing and making sure um, as they're working in the marketplace that they are creating um, that equal pay for all creators. Uh, and Eric, you see this issue directly when you're working with creators and diverse creators? Yeah, I, I think, look, the, the, this opportunity to co-create things is key. And I think the other thing is finding the connection between the creators that we're working with that have a authentic and real connection to what the products are that we're trying to sell, the stories that we're trying to, 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 to tell is also key. Can you share one example where you think you've really overcome that barrier and you've started with a client really to engage effectively and authentically with D&I? And then after that, do one where there's a, a challenge that you're say, maybe still wrestling with. And if we start with Kerry, then we'll go over to Eric. Um. Sure, I can definitely. So where we're, where we're seeing a lot of success right now um, is starting with that truly understanding on a brand um, who the audiences are. 
um, and then um, making sure that we are doing the work to understand um, the brand opportunity and aligning the spend to that brand opportunity. So really creating more of that equity in where the spend is going. Um, and that is work that we're seeing a lot of clients want to do right now. So whether it's CPG clients or QSR or financial clients that we have, they're all really leaning in right, th right in that space right now and really understanding and quantifying um, the opportunity. Um, in places where I think that we um, can do a better job, it is, I think probably on the creative side and the media side working together um, much earlier in the process to make sure um, that as we're either creating uh, the content that's reflective of the consumer or we're identifying the media um, that's the right place to run, um, that we have all of that working in unison. Um, I think that's where most brands have missed historically um, is either finding the right uh, media to reach audiences and then falling short on the creative um, or having the right creative and then not amplifying it in the right spaces. So um, I think creative and media working really closely <coughs> early in the process is how we can solve that. Uh, Eric. Yeah, I, I, uh, I think a huge shout out to one of our clients that we work with, which is JBL Harmon. They've done a really good job of being, you know, very inclusive in all of their work. It grows every year, and I think now their work feels, um, it feels incredibly authentic for the community. It feels like it starts with um, inclusion first, and I think that that's where the future uh, uh, of work needs to go. I think places where you see it continues to be a challenge, um, I think we've done a good job as an industry of bringing diversity in front of the camera. There's still not enough diversity, inclusion, and belonging behind the camera. And I think that, that like when we talk about the creators, we've talked about people that we're using as influencers. You make a, a, a really important point that half of the creators on YouTube are, um, are diverse. The reality is when you go to big commercial shoots, there's still not enough diversity behind the camera. And one of our big focuses and what we're trying to do in production is create that new balance where there is just as much diversity behind the camera as we've gotten to in front of the camera. I think. And I think that's just for everybody to think about, make sure it's, it's not good enough unless it looks right. You've got to keep pushing. Yeah. And that goes from hiring, talent, development, all your point, the pipeline all the way back to recruiting from certain environments and communities all the way through to getting people in front of behind camera and in media plan. Um, if you had one wish that you could uh, get from the industry, if you had granted one wish, what would that one wish be as we go on this journey together? Um, yeah, I think it's just to act. Um, so, you know, make sure that you're acting in the way um, that shows the importance um, of delivering against diverse audiences. Um, it's not enough n anymore to just say that you've, uh, you know, allocated two percent of your budget. You've really got to act. Yeah. Yep. I, I think that that's well. Said. How many clients are out there? So I, I think one of the things that we all hope for is that we know we live in a divided society. We know that the challenge of putting work out there that starts new conversations in communities that. Um, that aren't the, the uh, aren't always the core target, but are also the target that can, we can most impact. That it takes some bravery, and I think that's something that are those are conversations that I think we want to have, and I think they're conversations that we need to have. Um, we live in a time where the whole conversation here is about brand safety, and it's scary to start uh, uh, provocative conversations. But if we really are going to do work that's purposeful that makes a difference in these communities that we want to serve and help, we have to bring some bravery to that. So I think I play that back. I think the things I'm hearing is do the work. You can't shortcut this stuff. Mm -hmm. It's hard, it's complicated. The measurement, the access, the finding the creators, bringing them together, building out media plans that go from entertainment to sports to content to sponsorship. It's harder than spots and dots. Mm -hmm. So we got to do the work and that takes time and resource. Agencies today, time and resource are probably two things that are quite scarce. Mm -hmm. So that means commitment from the senior most level all the way down through. And, and, and the bravery that I think we've sort of been a little caught in this sort of safety trap of the era of exclusion. And it's easy to block out the stuff that may or may not be dodgy. Yeah. 
but in that net we've caught an awful lot of things that should not have been included. Mm -hmm. So I if I had my one ask, I'd be going, as we think about this journey from the world of chaos into let's being cautious, well, I'd love us to be able to go from cautious to conscious. Mm -hmm. I'd love us to be able to think about how do we behave responsibly for a brand, but we actually behave inclusively and effectively as well. So together what we do, and this is a team sport, we go from this era of exclusion and together we journey towards an era of inclusion. Inclusion not because it's just the right thing to do and it's ethically right, but as Mark Pritchard and many others say and the data shows, it's actually good for your brand, good for your business, good for your consumers. So as a, as a wrap up to this, Rob, Brand Safety Institute, thank you for inviting us. Uh, for my panel members, thank you for being here. But to everybody here, it's not enough to sit, think, and then just, nah, it's all good. <laughs> what we all have to do is act. I take your words. Let's just do it. Act. So yeah. what I'd ask you to do, let's be conscious, let's be conscious together, and let's push away from this era of exclusion and together march to this era of inclusion so we can do the right thing for all the constituents, not just the bank balance. With that, thank you very much indeed.